Welcome everyone to the fourth episode of the Not So Alpha Males podcast with your host, me, Toby, and my good friend, Tom. Tom, how are you doing? How's your week been? I'm good. I'm very, very good. I am pumped as hell for this episode. I'm so excited to bring you my topic this week because I'm generally actually infused by it. So you are I'm, sitting I want to get into it. Sitting on the edge of your seat there, Tom. Very, I am, mate. I am. Excited. What have you got as your as your drink of choice for this week? Oh, well, okay, let's do this. Let's get out of the way. Let's. I want to get into my topic, man. But Drink-wise, uh, I have got a sidecar this week. Have you ever heard of that? I have not heard of a sidecar. Uh, it's uh, it's not really a popular drink anymore, I don't think. It's actually from the 1920s. Oh, I just typed in I just typed in like a cocktail selector thing online and spun a wheel and this came out. So I thought, why not do that? <laughs> uh, it, it, and it, it's named after the sidecar of a motorcycle. So uh, I'm hoping, and it was invented in France, in Paris... And Mate, I'm this isn't your topic. I, Just tell us what the cocktail. When I start, is. when I start drinking it, I hope to be like along the cobbles of the Paris uh, Ooh, yeah. streets. So we'll not see stuck at goes. home in Birmingham. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and I want to do whatever I can to get away from there. So yeah. And what's it? What's in the drink? Uh, it has cognac, okay, um, Cointreau, and lemon juice and a little bit of ice. So quite an alcoholic one. Yeah, that sounds nice. Right, we'll see how it goes. Anyway, what about you? I've gone for the white lady this week. Ooh. So I wanted to base it on gin, as I'm a big lover of gin. And I this one's, that, yeah. yeah, 50ml gin, 25ml of Contro, and some lemon juice. And that is it. And it, to be fair, I'm giving it a sip. It's quite nice. It's hard to drink quick, so that might benefit mm. us for this episode. But I'm starting to realise a lot of cocktails, you just don't drink quick. It's not like drinking wine or uh, beer. You just you just sip it. You sip it and yeah. enjoy it. I think we should do that for this episode, just so we don't any, lose track any, by the end. True. Any any background information on a uh, white lady? No. No. Some, <laughs> someone, seems somewhat, seem, seem someone's doing a little bit more effort on this. I, I didn't want to waste the, the time other. that we have talking about drinks. So. <laughs> anyway, well, let's just that's... kick it off then. So I'll, I'll kick us off this week, Tom, and I'm going to talk to you about Mars. Trying to keep it relevant, you know, like like we do on this podcast. I hope mm. you saw the Perseverance rover that landed on Mars a couple of weeks. I did, did. Big days, big days for yeah. NASA there. So I want to talk about, you know, why, why are we so obsessed about Mars and the future of humanity? Are we going to go to Mars? What would it take to like live there and things like that? Mm. Do you know much about Mars, Tom? Not really, apart from it's called the Red Planet um yeah not really and, and you know we're trying to go there but that's that's about as far as my knowledge extends okay that's good because we're gonna, we're gonna learn a lot together today gonna it's learn gonna be a good lot. <laughs> it's gonna be good so i'm gonna ask you first why why are we so obsessed with mars do you think and not other planets um is it mainly because it's the closest one for starters so you know most <laughs> easy to get there Fallen into the trap. Uh, oh, is it not? <laughs> no. Everyone thinks oh, Mars shit. is the closest planet, but basically Venus is often closer to oh, Earth than, than Mars is. Okay. Right. So why don't we care about Venus? Um, is that because that's like, is that the gas planet one? Which well, is like, so you just... that's no gas giants, but oh, it does okay. have an atmosphere no. there. Okay. Um, why are we... We, don't care, we, we don't care so much about Venus um, mm. because we actually did initially. So we were quite obsessed about Venus oh. at first, and it's the okay. brightest um, thing in the in the sky. Um, mm. So people focus on it quite a lot. You know, Venus is the goddess of beauty and love. Okay. Um, oh, okay. And it was this, you know, shining kind of star, and they were like, "Wow, that's beautiful." Mm. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's how that's how they came up with that. They were like, "God, that's beautiful. That is. Yeah. We'll call that Venus then." Anyway, okay. you know, Venus is in the habitable zone, so I don't know if you know about the Goldilocks zone. Where mm, I do know about that. Too, stuff, if you're yeah. too close, you're too hot. If you're too far away, you're too cold. Problem is, yeah. we went there and found out the surface is hot enough to melt lead. Pretty hot, then. Yeah, it's the hottest planet in our actual solar system. So Mercury, that's actually close to the uh, sun, is actually not as hot as Venus's average temperature. Wow. Okay. Do you know why? That's because the atmosphere on venus has a runaway greenhouse effect so what we've got right now but crazy amounts worse than what we have so 
its atmosphere is like 90 times denser than Earth. So if you're on the surface, you'd just crush into into nothing. And it's, yeah, basically, it's a no-go, right? So mm-hmm. I just want to tick that one off, why we don't care about Venus. The other ones, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're too cold. Um, there are moons on like Saturn and Jupiter that we care about, but I'm not going to talk about that in this episode. So okay. that's a future okay. one. Future episodes. About. Yeah, because yeah. they're actually quite interesting, some of them, because um, they do mm-hmm. have atmospheres and things. Anyway. So we're looking at Mars, and when we looked up in like the early 1900s in our telescopes, we saw all these like canals and things. The scientists were like, "Wow, there's canals on on Mars. There's this civilization that use it for travel and agriculture. All these like water channels." And it wasn't till like the 60s when we actually sent something there that we found out that it's this lifeless, barren place. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, they actually genuinely thought there was water flowing and the civilization yeah, yeah. until like, was like, oh wow. Well, I don't know if it was to the 60s, they still fully believed it, but <laughs> it was definitely, you know, the 20s, there were things in the newspaper where it was like, oh my God, look at the civilization that they're doing. Ah. Um, I think wow. when they sent a satellite there, they must have still believed that they could be. <laughs> anyway, it was lifeless, um, but mm-hmm. we did see signs of water had been there before. Uh, and it's believed that, you know, billions of years ago, Mars would have looked very much like Earth. And they also think that about Venus as well. So that's why we're sending Perseverance there, because they want to search for ancient microbial life forms when they're there. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about the mission too much, because you can just Google about that. But I want to go into why we care and why we're doing all this work about Mars. And I think it is, goes to the, the fact that we want to one day live there, colonise it. Because that's the way we're not going to die out as a species. If we don't leave Earth, we're going to be screwed because one day there's going to be a, a meteor with our name on it or the sun's mm. going to kill us. Is that uh, is that NASA's end goal as well? Or is, or is they just exploring it for scientific curiosity and it's only like Elon Musk that's really going for the habit? Uh... I think the whole thing of NASA, it's the curiosity to learn about stuff, but mm. it's all for a reason. Like we want to be that kind of it's to progress humanity um it might not seem like it now that we're only doing these tiny little tests but you've got to start somewhere and them kind of results you can then use further on anyway i want to now ask you a question right so we want to colonize mars so what do you think would kill us on mars apart from the lack of atmosphere um because i know we could solve that or they're going to solve that with like the little pods and stuff and make it all climatable in there um the 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 heat the temperatures like, is there going to be a massive difference between where there's a uh, sunlight shining and when there's shadow? Yeah, I don't know. What? What? Okay. Yeah, is there something else? What is it? So Mars doesn't have a iron core that's like Earth. So uh-huh. I don't. I don't know how much you know, but the Earth's iron core it basically creates the magnetic field that protects the planet um, because it's the uh-huh. it's a liquid molten which causes all the electrical currents and building of the magnetic field and what they think with mars it was it's actually half the size of earth and because of that's that small oh yeah do you know why it's half the size they reckon it was because jupiter um, where that formed it was it held all the material from the asteroid belt so between mars and jupiter there's the asteroid belt and um, the gravitational pull of jupiter is so big that it didn't let mars collect all that material so ah. it's much smaller yeah okay makes sense um anyway so the core they reckon is kind of congealed and it's not fluid anymore so they reckon that's why mars lost all its atmosphere because it lost its magnetic field um which then what's it called the solar wind uh, it took away all the atmosphere and initially it's really really bad for like cancer and stuff so like if you went to mars you wouldn't last long because you'd you'd have cancer Really? Quick. Okay. Because yeah, right. there's no, there's nothing to protect you from the, su- the sun's radiation. Anyway, as I said, the the solar wind stripped it of its atmosphere, so the atmosphere is only one percent of what we have on Earth. Um, right. And mm-hmm. going back to our engineering days, Tom, uh, cool. if you have a really low pressure, the boiling point of water goes down. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it means that if you went out your spacesuit, your blood would just instantly boil if you were on the surface. Um, okay pretty big problem yeah so you're gonna die of cancer you're gonna your blood's gonna boil the one percent atmosphere is carbon dioxide so you're not gonna be able to breathe it so you're gonna suffocate and as you said it's really cold 
uh, the average temperature is minus 63 degrees C, but you can actually get quite a nice temperature at noon on the equator. So it can get to nice 20 degrees. So that'd, that'd be right. It's not bad. Not but bad. then if you're at the poles, it can go as low as minus 153. Wow, that's close to absolute. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cold. It's pretty cold. So the thing is, there's all these problems, but NASA believes that we probably solve a lot of these in the short term. So, you know, spacecraft, it can protect us from the radiation for the amount of time, and mm. create breathable atmosphere for us. Or the question is, how do we live in the long term on Mars? Is this where it gets into like terraforming? Yes, I'm going to tell you about the two main options that we have. One is that we can live in these little biodomes, bio cities. And two is that we terraform Mars. Now, I'm going to talk to you about mm-hmm. the terraforming bit for the, uh, initially. And what, what that actually means. Like, do you know, do you know what it means? Um, my understanding would be just making an inhospitable planet hospitable. <laughs> um, somehow warming it up to be a nice temperature for us and somehow forming an atmosphere for us. Pretty spot on, yeah. Um, hey, there you go. The physics isn't actually that complicated. It's a three-step process, they say. It's the first oh, wow, one. that's quite simple. <laughs> yeah. The first step is we need to create a magnetosphere so as i said the the magnetic shield from the sun is what we need otherwise you won't be able to create an atmosphere you have all the cancer and stuff so they actually reckon you could probably put a satellite in between the sun and mars which emits a big electromagnetic kind of shield and because it's in between the two it can then protect mars it would take a lot of energy and stuff but there's, mm. there's things called Lagrange points, which is like the gravity of the sun and Mars. It means that it's just kind of in that loop. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. you could do that. And then once you've done that, you want to build this atmosphere and you want to first pump it with greenhouse gases. So how would you get that there? Um, they think that Mars has actually got a lot of carbon dioxide trapped underneath the kind of surface of mars and then and they have you know the poles so the north and the south pole there's ice caps there and it's normal ice and dry ice which is carbon dioxide so our boy elon that we always reference in this podcast <laughs> we do talk about him a lot don't we, we actually do. um he reckons that we could drop some nuclear bombs on the on the polar ice caps i've heard um, this yeah yeah and it would uh, instantly kind of melt this ice which would then release all this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and that's what they call the quick way but a lot of scientists think there's not enough there on the ice caps to actually do enough of that and you might end up causing a lot more problems and with all (laughs) radiation and stuff like that i was going to say the problem isn't with the nuclear winter but just there's not enough of the actual ice (laughs) yeah well they think if enough of it got blown away when the core froze then you wouldn't have enough so you could build these factories and things which would pump out all the gases and stuff going back to what you're saying about the molten core that's now solidified and that's the problem for the magnetic field if you somehow warmed up the surface temperature and gave it an atmosphere would the iron core ever melt back again and then produce a magnetic field and solve that problem so you wouldn't need the satellite solution i don't think so because what it what it needs is the the mass, so it, oh, it, you okay. need the gravity and the pressure to kind of melt the iron. Gotcha. So if you don't gotcha. have the mass like Earth has, it's not gonna it's not gonna just be hot enough to suddenly melt the iron inside. Mm. Good question though, Tom. Good question. So and then the third point, we've got all this CO two. We've built these like factories that can emit all this carbon dioxide. We then can release this bacteria uh, which is what they think happened on earth you know billions of years ago this bacteria that absorb all the co2 and release oxygen and from that you can then build a proper atmosphere with oxygen and stuff like that this process would take hundreds to thousands of years it's not a quick one so you oh, know, I, I thought it'd be longer <laughs> well yeah I, I reckon it's in the thousands not hundreds but if you do the quick okay. thing like elon and blow up the ice caps and it works it might it might be good but you could like do other things like you could cover the planet with satellites that with mirrors that focus more heat onto the planet and stuff like that there's there's other things but the main thing is the physics isn't actually that complicated um but the actual politics to it makes it 
like could you ever imagine a body that would come together and invest all this money and time in doing that no, i couldn't i couldn't see it happening no unless there was some sort of global initiative like a, an asteroid was going to come hit us so we all had to get on the same boat and try to save ourselves no but well, you think you just try and get rid of the asteroid if if at that or point. you do that way yeah so yeah i don't think that's a that's a that's a whole lot of money yeah i think that kind of terraforming is it's a nice idea but i don't think we have the collaboration to actually do it that's a shame yeah, which then leads us on to the second option, which is having these kind of biodomes and these pockets of of like life on Mars that's the same as Earth, apart from the gravity, because it's like a third of the gravity, so you could just bounce around everywhere, which would be quite cool. You would create these conditions that we have, like on Earth. And uh, what I want to focus on is that there was this um, trial that they carried out in the 90s, and it's called Biosphere 2. I don't know if you've heard about it before. No. No, no. So this billionaire basically spent a hundred and something million dollars on creating this, <laughs> creating this kind of habitat which was completely self-sustaining. So you wouldn't have anything going in and out. All the uh, uh, all the oxygen would be replenished inside, and it was basically called the Biosphere Two. And they called it Two because Biosphere One they say is Earth. So this would be kind of the second Biosphere. So they're trying to make like a whole little mini Earth. Yeah, in terms of climate, and it's it's pretty impressive. Like if you Google some of the images of Biosphere Two, and you've got a minute, like it's big. Mm. It's not like it's a small little kind of pod. It's like got loads okay, of different yeah. little habitats and ecosystems. Wow. They had like you know real life animals that they had to look after, like bees and uh, like forests and things like that. It's pretty cool. And uh, to be fair. If I was a billionaire, that's what I'd spend my money on. <laughs> like, how cool would that be? <laughs> but nothing else has been really done it like it since, like on that scale. They've had like trials where they've locked people away together, but not on this scale. Anyway, what they did was put four men and four women in for two years in this facility. Ooh, so you had wow. to live in there for two years. And it was a bit of a disaster. They had oh. so many issues with it. They, they ran low on food. They right. ran low on oxygen um, to the point where they actually had to end up pumping in oxygen because it got to the point where if you're sleeping, you might not actually st- carry on breathing. Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> um, one lady actually had to leave because she sliced off her finger fingertip and she had to then – she left, got medical attention and came back. So, like, there was a bit of a media, like, shitstorm with it and – yeah, they 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 said it was just kind of a waste of money and a waste of time, but it was quite like interesting to see how it's it might not be the techno technological problems that are the main issues with it. It might actually be the human issues. Mm. Um, there was this interview with um, one of the biospherians. She basically said that they did all the things that you shouldn't have done as like a kind of handbook of living in these conditions. So one of the worst things that you can do is is put in a team of eight into something like this. There's a syndrome called irrational antagonism. And it's basically that you split into groups. Um, Mm. So there's two groups of four. And there's basically this power struggle that happened where one of the groups, they got really close and the other group got really close and they are making decisions. One of them wanted to do more research things. And then the other group wanted to do more focusing on just the survival aspect of it. They had all these arguments. They'd still did the job that they needed to do, but they just didn't get on at all. She says in this interview, you know, it was really pretty awful. I could be so cold to the people in the other group walking by them, not even looking at them. Um, but whilst there was no fist fights, um, they complained about each other. And apparently one of them got spat at twice. (laughs) (laughs) So imagine being locked away in this thing with eight, seven other people. Like you're going to end up despising each other. Like we'd hate each other. Um, And like that kind of psychology aspect, how do you get a team to work for that long period of time? These these people that went in, they went in, I I think you just did say it, but they went in with a job. Like they did know, it wasn't like randomers who they just thought we'd put random people in here just to see how they survive and everything like that. Like in my mind, when we go to Mars, we will 
be picking a team, at least at the very start, it won't be like sending a civilization there, a whole group of people. It'll be like picking a team that have been trained to work together like that. Because isn't it the same situation sending people to the International Space Station? Yeah, so they, they've actually done loads of studies in the National Space Station. And they NASA have got this like report. They have like the kind of biggest danger, dangers for astronauts and their the psychology aspect and like what would actually be the biggest danger in like a confined environment and it was quite interesting like on the checklist number two i think number one was like a allergic reaction to something so if you're eating yeah. something and you needed sudden medical attention number two was acute psychosis um i don't know if you know what psychosis is but it's basically when you lose contact with reality and it might involve you seeing things hearing things that people don't see and believing things that aren't actually true and there was this there was this other interview and it was um it was a NASA astronaut and this was when they were actually I think building the space station so uh he was basically saying that there was one person who was just obsessed with the hatch and he he would say you know all I got to do is turn that handle and the hatch opened and he's saying like it's the scariest thing because this is a trained astronaut and He's, he's thinking like he's, that kind of at, like that thing of like the big red button like oh I want to push it or or yeah, like yeah, yeah. standing on a on a train station and being like or oh, you know I could be pushed I by someone just step you in front. Push. yeah like that kind of it, you could do it and it was number two on the actual list of the biggest dangers on this checklist and uh, do you know what the instructions was it was um basically tie them down and tranquilize them that's that all you can do <laughs> that's the solution is that kind of the same as when you're driving and then i don't know if you've ever had this but you're just driving along and you're like i could just swerve this car <laughs> the oncoming traffic right now like i could just flip it or something oh is that just me i think, <laughs> like, have I got I think a we need to get you help tom i think we need to get you help <laughs> <laughs> no do you actually seriously not have no, that have you never I had do, that i do know what you mean oh like, thank god you can okay, you can just be like oh i, I could just it's a weird thing right and it's, okay. it's a natural thing. Like I wouldn't say that you're a, a crazy lunatic <laughs> to have that, but I mean, we do need okay. to get you some help. Um, <laughs> we'll look at that after this episode then. Yeah. And so like that kind of psychology side, bear in mind, they said in the, the biosphere, the first six months weren't really a problem. It was only when you realise that you're caught of the way through that and you've got two whole years. That's when the problems really started. And um, it's like me and my studies right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, you got to think like the flight to Mars is at fastest a seven month journey just to get there. So you don't have all of this kind of like thing that they're going to have. And that's just a flight there. Right. And then you land and you, you live in this habitat and you've got to, you've got to be there for at least a year or two, because the way the orbits work, you need to make sure they line up before you go again. How, how are we going to get people to stay alive just from themselves? for that amount of time to actually build a habitat and live there you probably only start not having to worry about the problems when you've got like loads of people living there because that's when you can interact with different people get away with yes. from other people but yeah. then what kind of life is it to be stuck in this little bubble do we yeah. want to do well, i've heard i don't know i think i've seen something about the first few people that are going to mars is it that that they're not going to be coming back? They're kind of it's to spend the rest of their life there. Well, I, I, there's obviously the talk of that being like a one way trip. I would love to go to Mars. Don't get me wrong, but the psychological aspect of when you're there and you're doing your job, and then when you start to think, oh, this is actually not the best thing. Having no like out of that, being stuck there, that's when all the psychology problems are going to happen. Yeah, like, that's when the hatch. That's when the hatch starts to look pretty nice. Yeah, exactly, and stuff like that. That so I, I don't think you can have a one way trip unless you mm. pick people who are so like they don't care of their, about their lives that much. But then would they want to go? I I don't know. It's really hard. Yeah. and it's yeah. yeah. So anyway, I've I've spoken well enough. I think summarize that was really good. Yeah, to summarize, I think technological. Maybe one day we can do all these things, but can we? program our minds and get people to to live like that is mm. probably the biggest challenge just on a curiosity note when you were doing all this research did you see when we might first be going over like when's like i think when they wanna, might this happen i think they want to the first person to go to mars is in 2030 
2024 or 2030 something. Oh, okay. So it's not far. Like that's what SpaceX are doing. They've got their their new rocket that they're testing out now to take us to mm. Mars. Um, yeah, I yeah, saw that landing pretty well, but then exploding five minutes later. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like it's just like the te- technology. Yeah, we can do it, but we haven't really thought about the seven months of getting there, then getting there, then living in these tiny little bubbles. Like there's so much more to it. And NASA are thinking about that as well. It's not like they're just forgetting about it, but that's, I think, the biggest problem. Anyway, Tom, over to you. I've spoken far too long. Yeah, no, right. My psyche has been kind of cracked with the topic I'm doing this week. Uh, I'm doing, if you've ever heard about it, the simulation theory. Oh, is it broken? It really has got me questioning reality. Is this why you want to open the hatch? I want to open the hatch. I want to open the hatch and I want to wake up because this is a simulation, mate. (laughs) Um, I I guess I'll start off by saying our video games, obviously we know they're getting more and more lifelike as time goes on with like just a simple like better game mechanics, uh, image and sound quality is always improving. And now you've got like VR and uh, the immersion quality factors of VR is just incredible. And so... It's almost, it's like a foregone conclusion. Like at some point, hopefully soon, to be honest, because I'd like to be able to do it. But at some point, our simulations and our virtual worlds, uh, not just gaming, but like all sorts that's simulated on computers and things like that, uh, will be indistinguishable from life itself. And if that's true, how do we know that that hasn't already happened? And we are in that simulation right now. Mm. I might just leave it there, to be honest. (laughs) That's it. Thank you for listening to episode four. Um, Leave them them on a knife edge. I mean, so like, have you watched the Matrix films? I have, but it's many years ago. So no, no, it's good. That's just got respect for you. That's that's all I wanted to ask that question for. Um, (laughs) No, but have you got any? Before I get into it, and because it is a it is a rabbit hole and a half, this theory. Uh, have you got any kind of, long episode this have you it? got have you got any kind of preconceptions or thoughts about living in a simulation so i have heard of it before about the simulation theory um, mm-hmm. i know that apparently the chances of it are much higher than we would ever think because you know the way technology is going we will eventually have the capability of doing that so would we then put ourselves in a simulation Mm. maybe i guess i i don't know um yeah and essentially the simulation theory is why has that not happened before then either in this reality that we're looking at right now i mean we've been on the planet for well life's been around for billions and billions of years how do you know that it's not already happened and then you're just in the simulation now and blah blah, blah. so but i'll get into it i mean what i want to say about it overall is that we are we're not in this episode today we're not going to work out if we are or are not in a simulation i'm afraid oh please come on uh, that's the, i'm afraid that question is going to go unanswered <laughs> but it's more this is this is actually a philosophical thing really and so it is more of a fun thought experiment and interesting ideas do crop up when you start applying it to reality well to this reality that we're looking at right now so the simulation hypothesis is the proposal that all of reality, so the Earth, the entire universe, is a complete artificial simulation, okay? So a computer simulation. And this was a theory popularised by a philosopher called Nick Bostrom uh, at the University of Oxford here in the good old UK. So I'm going to be dropping that name quite a lot because he's sort of the forefather of this whole idea. He released a paper in 2003 which sort of kick-started this whole idea so it's not like the Matrix movie where you're uh, you are a real person and then you can and you're stuck in a simulation. You might wake up and then be in reality. The simulation theory is that we ourselves are simulated. Our brains are artificial already, and we're in an artificial environment. So everything's fake. <laughs> so what if we just if we topped ourselves, we wouldn't just go into another. Body. That's just that's just the end of your simulation. Nothing happens. Like it's just that's isn't that your characters died <laughs> isn't that just life it's set well unless you've got a religious kind of view yeah yeah no exactly that just life anyway yeah yeah but the point is we're not like a we aren't a real person waiting to wake up or get out of the simulation we are ourselves an artificial intelligence in some sort of computer simulation does that make sense 
basically yeah. nothing's real <laughs> <laughs> in this whole thing that you're looking at right now nothing exists in real life well if that's the case i'm gonna get this bottle of vodka one second <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong. You'll still perceive it as a bottle of vodka. No. So, okay. Now that I've uh, now that I've clarified that bit, or I guess actually a brilliant way to describe it, okay, is when we look at our computer games today, and you're running around as a character, or whatever. Imagine that that character is actually an AI. So you know how we're trying to form AIs at the moment. You know, a complete artificial intelligence, and we're going to give it a robot body to live in this world. Essentially, it's that same thing, apart from it's going to be in a simulated world as well. So an artificial intelligence in an artificial environment, that's what the simulation hypothesis is. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. struggling. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, Don't I worry. It. It's, like, it's, not, it's not even like VR. It's not like you're living no. in the simulation. No. It's it's, you can't there. wake up from it. You are a simulation yourself, essentially. I'm just a bot, basically. You're a bot. <laughs> you're an absolute bot. <laughs> <laughs> so... This is very close to a concept called ancestor simulations. So ancestor simulations refer to simulating the actions of all of the neurons in your brain. And then you simulate the sensory input to that artificial brain to the point with enough fidelity that the brain itself can't work out that what is being fed is fake. So it goes into what I was saying in episode one, if uh, yes, any viewers haven't heard that. Stuff. Yeah, you should go have a We, we always build on our ideas here. Yeah. We're always building. <laughs> what you're saying is that you could make a brain that thinks it's a brain and can depict that it's not a brain. Yes. Except, but it's yeah, just still code, really. But Yeah, so imagine that me and you have uh, coded an AI in our computer. Okay, great, it's in the computer. And then in that code, we give it uh, ability to sense its surroundings, you know, with sight. And then we make an image in the computer as well, like a perfect landscape. The basis of the simulation hypothesis is that when you make the brain clever enough to know it's like self-aware and everything like that, and then when you make the picture as great as possible, the brain won't be able to tell that the picture is actually a fake and it's all in this fake world. And like we ourselves are the base reality, like the actual real life reality. God, this is going to be a real difficult but podcast. That's, so you... sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think I get it, but it's just one of them things that you could never unprove or prove. Yes. Right? Yeah. So that's, I, I kind of will end on that. It's like, it's an unfalsifiable concept. So I'll just ruin the conclusion. I'll, is that what you're saying? Kind of. Thanks. Let's just end it here. No, but it's, it's more of a thought experiment. It is a philosophical argument. It's an existential thing to think about. So before we get into if it's true or not, thank you for the heads up there. Uh, I want to talk about the kind of computer and technology advancement that it would actually take to make it possible in our world. So like what we might do in the next 50 years, say, going back to some of the statistics that you brought up in episode one, the human brain has 100 billion neurons and well over 100 trillion synapses. And it's estimated that to simulate the entire operation of a single human brain, would require anywhere between 100 trillion and 100 quadrillion binary operations for every second of time. So I hope you to took s- that. Did you take them figures from from the podcast or? I did take those figures. We're from the definitely going to have contrast in numbers there. We, we, <laughs> we can't self source. <laughs> so <laughs> so to, to simulate a whole entire brain for one second, it takes up to 100 quadrillion operations. Which is quite mad. I mean, we all know. Yeah, I think I think I place. said I think I said four quadrillion, but you said up to. So it's. I mean, there's a lot. Yeah, of I had a tr- I had a hundred trillion to a hundred quadrillion. That's a big right, range, yeah. anyway. <laughs> it's massive, yeah. Yeah. So um, Bostrom, so the guy who uh, founded this argument, uh, then argues that it doesn't take close to that to actually simulate the environment around it. So, like you know. We always say the brain is the most complex thing in existence. I think you even said that in uh, yeah. your episode. That the so the actual environment that the brain's within takes a lot less computing power. So for the sakes of arguments, let's just focus on being able to simulate a human brain. To get even madder, a full ancestor simulation. So when you want to simulate the whole of human existence, if we take say the last fifty thousand years, there's been approximately a hundred billion people who have lived and died over those years 
Uh, and the average lifespan over the last 50,000 years has been 30 years, which I thought no, was really. quite, yeah. Do, when you, do you know why there? Because I, I do know why. For this oh, one. you go for it. You jump in. Because um, apart from the last 100 years, the amount of children that die before they get to like five is like really high. So that brings down the average like massively. So it was like right. back in even like ancient Greek times, once you get past your like 10th birthday, you're more likely then to make it to your 20th birthday. And then you're more likely to make it to your 30th. Yeah. And then when you get to a certain old age, then that's when you're likely to die. But it's that early age that brings down the average. It's quite mad though, isn't it? Average 30. And then today we walk around taking for granted an average of 80 odd. Well, like, it's because, yeah, it's because. But I know, yeah, because of the statistics. Die. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, digressing. Um, so 30 years is 1 billion seconds. Each second, as I said, requires that 100 trillion to 100 quadrillion operations. So if we multiply all those numbers together, in order to simulate the whole of human history, i.e. every mental brain that's ever existed over the last 50,000 years, <laughs> it's somewhere between 10 to the 34 and 10 to the 37 operations. For people who don't do maths, that's like 37 zeros after the after 10 yeah it, it's crazy <laughs> it's, it's a bit all far-fetched at the moment okay i'm going to be bringing it back in i'm just trying to get across how advanced a civilization has to be in order to actually come up with a simulation that something believes it is real yeah i, I would like to ask though the, the mm -hmm. why question like why would they i'm sure you oh well that, but... yeah I, I i can but i can jump that in now essentially the exact same reason that we simulate things in our world today to learn how one thing will affect something else. The same way we simulate a pipe or like a step in the pipe and you want to change the pipe size. Don't, be, don't give me back <laughs> them bad memories, man. <laughs> I know, but that's the easiest way I can think of it. Like, it's the same reason you simulate everything. Like, whatever their society is, if they're thinking of like, what would happen if you did this? What would happen if you did that? Like, how does cause and effect work? It's just a simulation. Like, that's all it is. Going back to the computing power, 10 to the 37 operations, absolutely mad. And then to compound that, if you want to try and envisage what computer could actually do that, I looked into that as well. And that's where this thing called a Jupiter brain comes into play. Have you ever heard of Jupiter brain? <laughs> I have not. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? Sorry, I've just, I've finished my cocktail. I'm in a bit of a jolly state now. So. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So this idea comes from a Robert Bradbury who wanted to know if you had a computer the size of Jupiter, hence the name, what's the computing power of it? Okay. <laughs> this is so much crap. <laughs> anyway, if you had a computer the size of a planet, essentially, the performing capability of that would be 10 to the 42 operations per second. Well, hey, with that. So essentially, yes. That's the what... Death Star. So, that's, Basically the Death Star. Yeah, there you go. So some advanced civilization would require a computer the size of a planet to be able to simulate a universe that we see around us today. Okay, that's, that's the requirements. Pretty mad. But I mean, as you say right at the start, technology is always improving. We will get there at some point in the future to have, you know, supercomputers yeah. the size of a planet. Depends so, if we work ourselves out before that. But yeah, Well, I'll, I'll... this is where the argument gets really interesting. Okay. So I'll cut you off there because this is where, this is the whole idea. So Bostrom's hypothesis isn't actually a hypothesis it's an argument he put forward in the paper there's three possibilities for humankind okay and one of them has to be true and you'll see why when i've read the three out so number one the chance of humans actually being able to produce these simulations without uh dying beforehand the planet blows up the sun dies <laughs> the out all those out. kind of things you know whatever happens an asteroid impact uh, there's pretty much an almost zero chance of us being able to reach that. So in the kind of same sense that you were talking about interplanetary travel and move ourselves to another planet to sustain life, you the chances of us getting far enough advanced to have a Jupiter brain capable of simulating all this kind of thing, we won't ever reach there because some natural disaster will happen already. Uh, but it's quite the... interesting you say that because I'm, I'm actually going to do a topic on it. It's called the, the Fermi Paradox. Ah. And it's uh, a thing on like, is there like a great filter where it's you can't get any further? But ah, that's absolutely. a little teaser yeah. for a future okay, episode. There, there. you go. Uh, number two is there is pretty much zero chance 
that if we did manage to get to this point, with all the advancements we have technology-wise, we wouldn't have any interest in making this big simulation and putting AIs into a simulation. There'd just be no point. Yeah, that's that's what my thought would be. Okay, yeah. Why would you bother? And then third is the probability that we are already living in a simulation is closer to one. So out of those three options, one has to be the truth. And being us being in a simulation already is part of that question. Like you can't discount that idea if you're looking. It's the same thing as what I said right at the start. If we're going towards a point where we're going to be able to make the simulation happen, then there is equal chance that we are in that simulation right now. So Bostrom puts this the chances down to a third of it of us being in a simulation right now, based on you know the three options that there are. But as you say, the problem is it is that most importantly there are no experiments that can actually disprove this belief, or so it's, it's unfalsifiable essentially, uh, which is a bit of a red flag for any theory to be honest. Uh, but it, as I say, it's a very interesting fourth experiments. With this idea then that it might all be a simulation already and to sort of add on to the uh, percentage chances that we are in it already. Bostrom crunches the numbers and shows that the number of virtual minds that's in life far exceeds the number of real minds. And what I mean by that is at any point, say, okay, let's, for argument's sakes, we are the real people, okay? We are the real ones. In 50 years' time, we are going to be able to build simulations and have AI and we'll be, you know, we'll be testing how AI reacts to simulations. Like that's, that's a natural progression of where technology is going. What happens then is you have us, 7 billion people, 8 billion people, whatever it is. Okay. And then you have the virtual world that we're creating for our simulations, which will have, you know, 7 billion people. But then when you're simulating these places, like say we are a simulation, those simulations themselves progress make a simulation. and then make their own <laughs> simulations. And so this, honestly, it's this like is an inception. inception it, thing, genuinely, right? this is the hypothesis. There is an inception-like chain of simulations from simulations from simulations <laughs> from a real thing. And so basically, that means then the number of simulated minds in existence far exceeds the number of base real minds. So us being here today... It's a far likelier chance just on pure numbers that we are a simulated mind and not a real mind, <laughs> you know, because it's like a 99 to one ratio. Yeah. So that's I mean, one that's of the like, arguments for it. Could it. Be, it could be <laughs> infinite though, right? Exactly. Like, yeah, like exactly. That. Yeah. Like how would you know who is the, the, the top dog in all of this? Yeah. Some people say it's arrogant for us to assume that we are, in a sense, you know, that we are the base reality. Because if you think about it, what is a big, big, deep question? What is reality? You know, it's just things, a electrical impulse going to your brain about apparently what you see, feel, smell and taste. You could very easily at some point in the near future will be able to code that into a computer. And so how is that computer not going to realize that that's not real when it's just it being comes told? Out of that consciousness though, doesn't it? Yeah, like, it's a real rabbit hole, and... honestly. It's such like, a rabbit hole. Such there's the whole hole. like spirituality side of it um, mm, yeah i know people are very spiritual i'm not no and i want to say like i want to say that this belief this theory it's like it's not mainstream well it is mainstream but it's not believed by the mass population of scientists uh it's very much people who are just interested and question existential kind of things uh and as you say, this belief does go against religion very, very harshly. And so a lot of people don't believe it after that. But the big thing as well is uh, it's not popular due to the fact that most, not if all of us, want a meaning in life. And if we're just a simulation, that kind of takes it away. Like, what, like it just takes away our sense of being. So a lot of people don't subscribe to it because they just don't want to believe that. They don't want that to be the, re- they don't want it to be a simulation. So, I mean, yeah, it's a, fuck it, it's a crazy one, but it, you can't disprove it. <laughs> but It's kind of made me think about life now, Tom. <laughs> Mate, I had a whole it? week of that. <laughs> I had a whole week of that. It's one like, of the things that you wish you can unsee, <laughs> but you can't. <laughs> but no, I, I, wish I, I, could. I, completely, I completely see the other side of it, though. Like, what you said is 
it definitely it is a possibility. It's plausible. That, yeah, I mean, it's it's not, but it is at the same time. Yeah, like, exactly. Because yeah, we don't yeah. live in a in a society that's technologically able to do that. We don't think it's possible. But once you get to that level, things become a possibility. We could do. Yeah, like imagine if mm. you were, you know, a million years, and say humanity was still around, and we'd become this space fearing civilization, right? You'd have all the resources in the universe to use. Why would you not just build a computer made it like yeah. from the size of Jupiter? Or you might have better te- like it's it's plausible. That's why I can. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah. it's not. If you know what I mean. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it's a shame that you can't prove it, basically, because it's like you want to know if it's real or not. Like you want to what, know what is real. Do you think can't there's? You know, if we looked in a telescope, like to the tiniest, tiniest scale, could you see like a pixel or something? Like, is that? Well, okay, is that this is where the rabbit hole gets weird because in the field of physics, when looking at uh, very, very, very minuscule elements of the universe, you know, you're at, well, actually, less than atoms, there's a principle called the holographic principle, which I can't understand, so I'm not going to get into this. This is just a little blip of something I saw when I was researching my simulation theory stuff. But the way I imagined it when I was trying to comprehend it was if you wanted to simulate an environment, you could do the whole picture from afar quite well. You know, like the the overall picture might look quite great. No faults, can't tell if it's real or not. But when you then go really, really fine into it, that's when you would actually see the problems with the simulation in the very same sense that when you've got to make a this is going engineering again when you've got to make a mesh a mesh for your cfd you know you've got to have a discrete uh, grid in the very same sense when you go to the small parts of the universe that's where the uh, faults are so to speak and so the holographic principle kind of I did read, or I don't know if I'm misunderstanding it, but from my understanding, it was kind of pointing to the fact that it does give some merit to the simulation theory. I think, um, you know, how you say the it breaks down and the tiny scale. Mm. Then you think like, you know, quantum mechanics, how weird that <laughs> is, like how things are entangled mm. and like pop in and out of existence. Like, that's pretty yeah. fucking weird. Like, it could is. that be the reason why? It's, it's just yeah, yeah that's the that's the lowest resolution of the simulation it just yeah doesn't go and that's further when it than that. breaks down and that's why i mean look no, it's it, it's a crazy crazy concept simulation theory um we are definitely gonna be having our own simulations you know uh i think yeah the vast majority of scientists believe one to two generations until we have a completely indistinguishable simulation we can put ourselves in i.e amazing vr so that's 20 to 50 years away, without a doubt. So then there's the argument that it's just already happened before or that it happened in a different existence. And then this person in this other existence has just simulated from the Big Bang up till now. And we're just where we are in the whole thing. Hmm. It really opens a lot of fucking doors of madness. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And if any any of our listeners feel like their life is worthless now, you know, just... <laughs> Yeah. You know, contact Tom on his Instagram <laughs> page and uh, we'll try and sort something out. No, I think it's really, I think it's like mind bending, but you can see the logic, but yes, whether you want to believe it is another thing. Yeah. And on no, that it... note, I think we should wrap up proceedings because we've talked. Yeah, that was an intense up. one. It was really intense. Like my mind feels broken. I yeah. thought mine was a bit soft with the Mars, like it wasn't too mentally difficult. But now I'm sorry, cool. and I think I might. Well, I got you questioning life. Bit. Yeah, I might make myself another white lady now and um, sign off on, with that. On that note, definitely recommend the sidecar. It's really good. Yeah, honestly, oh, good. Best yeah, cocktail I've made so far. I didn't think it was going to be nice, but it was nice. No. Anyway, right, good. We'll see everyone. And in two weeks' time, the next episode, be sure to follow us on Instagram if you don't already. Um, yeah. And you can find all the episodes on that. Anyway, see you in the next one. See you then.